and welcome to another acrylico tutorial on synesthesia. If you haven't watched the previous two tutorials on synesthesia, I would suggest you go watch them to get acquainted with the interface. Please subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell to support us into making more tutorials. And for more, you can check out our Patreon with different tiers to offer all touch designer files, online tools to create generative art, as well as personalized classes. I will leave the link in the description for anyone who is interested. Now back to the tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to see how we can expand the visuals library, how we can customize our own shaders to make them audio reactive, as well as how to map the interface in synesthesia with your own shaders. If we go here to our scenes, we can see the whole synesthesia visual library. There are many ways how we can expand this existing library. One way is here at the store with uh, additional scenes. Some of the scenes we can purchase, but there are also some that are for free. Another way is if we go here to the plus icon, we see here that there are three options to import scenes into our library. The first one is by importing synesthesia scenes. This you might find on the internet or on the Discord group of synesthesia. The other two options include shaders, the interactive shader format and shader toy. In this tutorial, we're going to see both these shader options. Let's see the first website for creating shaders, ISF. I'll leave all the links in the description box. Here we can browse for shaders as well as interact with the shaders real time on a browser. So you can do this or you can click on search and in here we have a list of shaders and how this works is when you find a shader you like, you click on it and download the zip file. I'll unzip the file and inside there will be two elements, a .fs and a .bs. From here I go back to Synesthesia, go to Import Interactive Shader Format, I'll import the FS file and click on Load Scene. And like so, we instantly get the scene that we imported. This scene will react as any other Synesthesia scene, meaning all the controls will apply to the scene and the elements it contains. This is very powerful because it increases the amount of scenes we have at our disposal, as well as we are able to customize them to our liking. If we want to add this scene permanently to our library, we go to Create Sign Scene in Library. Now, the second shader option here is the shader toy. For this option, we have the shader toy website to our disposal. Similar to ISF, we can also browse here for already done scenes that we can directly import and customize in Synesthesia. So let's import a scene from here and we'll see how we can make these scenes audio reactive and control its parameter using the Synesthesia interface. So let's first choose a scene. I already have a scene that I like, it's called Abstract Corridor. So I'll search for it and then I'll click on it. And here I'll copy the link and to import this we go back to Synesthesia, we'll paste the link right here and click on load scene. And actually this is all there is to it, we already have the scene in Synesthesia. So now to actually save this I'll go to create scene scene in library. Now this will be saved to my library and I can always access it. Different to the first option we saw, the scene controls on these shader scenes don't actually do much. But there is a way for us here to create our own controls and to make the scene audio reactive. Let's first see the controls. In Synesthesia there is a very nice feature. If we open the settings, go to General and we turn on the built-in scene editor, as soon as we do this, the editor icon in here will appear. Let's click on it and in here we have Abstract Corridor and we can actually edit the page. Let's click on Edit Scene and the code is now editable. This is all GLSL. In order to make changes here, we don't need to have a deep knowledge of GLSL though, we just need some common sense and an understanding of which variable values we can replace. For example, if we scroll down, we can notice that there are a couple of variables here that are straightforward, like the camera position, the look at, the field of view, and so on. So let's try something out. If we change the value of the field of view here and divide it by 1 instead of 3, then save the code and reload the scene, the field of view will change. Now it would make sense for us to have a way to control this value easily from the Synesthesia interface without having to constantly change the code. So to make this possible, we go to scene.json and here under the controls we have a JSON object inside these brackets. Let's copy one of these objects and paste them directly underneath. In here, let's replace the type to slider instead of toggle, since it makes more sense to have a slider of values for this specific effect. Under name, let's rename it to my field of view, so that I know later that this is a custom variable that I actually created. Now let's save the code and reload the scene, and if we scroll all the way down to the scene controls, we see that the slider that we just created was added to the interface. For now though, this slider goes from 0 to 1 and has actually no control over the scene. So first we need to change the values and we need to create a relationship between this slider and the actual field of view control. So first let's change the minimum value to 1 and the maximum value to 5. Save the code and reload the scene and limit values will update. 
Now let's go back to the GLSL editor and find the line with the FOV variable. To create a relationship here, we need to replace the value 1 here with the name of the slider which is created. So here we see why it was also important that we first change the limit values of 0 to 1. Great, so now let's save the code, reload the scene and now the slider will function properly. So by changing the value, we will actually change the field of view on our scene. Let's go back to the JSON editor and also set the default value to 1. So, just as easy as that, we created the slider. Now, in the same way, we can create a control, mouse, x, y, like this one right here. To do this, we copy-paste this JSON object here, named mouse, x, y, and we'll use this one to control the camera. So, let's first rename it to my look at. Now, the type of control here is an x, y, meaning this is a vec2, so a vector with two values. So once we have this, let's save and reload the scene. And in here I got an error because I copy pasted also this comma at the end, which doesn't belong here. So once I delete the comma, I have to save and reload again. And like so, I'll get my own mouse XY control on the interface. But what's still missing here is the relationship. But we now know what we have to do. We go back to the GLSL and find the look at variable. We see here that the value of this variable is set by the value of the camera position and a value coming from a VEC3 with an x, y and a z value. In the mouse x, y that we created, we had a VEC2 with x and y values. So we can replace the x and y values here with my look at. We save and reload and as easy as that, our control will be responsive and actually affect the look at parameter of our scene. Great, now we have two examples. Let's see a final one and this time with a toggle. We'll copy paste the toggle object and we'll use this to control the direction of the movement. So right now what we're doing is we're going into the tunnel, but we also want to have the possibility to toggle between going forward or going backward. So let's rename to my direction and this type of control can either take a value of zero or one. We save and reload and try not to make the same mistake with a comma as I did and we instantly have the toggle control. Now back to GLSL, we'll scroll through and try to find out where the direction is actually being set. We see here that we have a variable called forward. If we try to multiply its value by minus 1 and save and reload the scene, then the camera will be moving forwards. So when we multiply by 1, the camera will go forward, and when we multiply by minus 1, the camera will go backwards. So we know now that this is the variable that we're actually looking for. Great, so now from here I'm going to first declare a variable which is going to hold the default value. Let's call it direction movement, and this is going to be equal to 1. Then we're going to multiply the forward value with the variable we just created, so with direction movement. And now for our button to actually work, we're going to set a condition and we'll say if the button is toggled on, meaning my direction is equal to 1, then we'll set the direction movement to minus 1. And that's all it takes, and now we can easily switch the direction of the movement with a toggle control. Great, so now we saw how we can interact with the scene with all these types of controls. Now on to the audio reactive part of the tutorial. We have countless possibilities here. First, let's scroll down, and the frog color variable here is the output of GLSL. For this animation, I want the colors to be inverted every time the bass hits. In the previous tutorial, we saw that when we expose the OCC variables from Synesthesia to Touch Designer, there are a lot of channels which contain the audio information. All these audio channels we're speaking of can also be found inside GLSL. So if I go ahead and type SYN, we notice here all the variables that affect the audio reactivity inside Synesthesia, like hits, intensity, level, bass and so on. Let's see an example now to illustrate how this works, but you can come back to this and try out all these other variables with different music and different scenes. Now the plan here is first we'll get the bass value from the music, then we'll decide on a threshold and every time the bass value surpasses the value of the threshold, the colors in the scene will be inverted. So let's do this. First let's start by creating a float variable called bass and this will be scene base hits and we'll multiply this value with a sin base presence. Now the sin base presence can only take two values. 
0 when there is no bass and 1 for when the bass is present. So as long as there is no bass in the music the value will be 0 and the whole variable will also take the value of 0. And every time the bass is present this value here will be 1 and our variable will have the value of the actual bass hits. Great, now for the threshold we'll set the condition first. We're gonna say if our bass is bigger than 0.3 0.3 in this case is just a random value that we can tweak later according to the value of the base. So now we have the condition and whenever this condition applies, we want the colors to be inverted. To do this, we'll take the variable frag color dot r and this will have a value of 1 minus frag color dot r. And this is how we do the color inversion in GLSL. This for now is for the red channel. So we'll have to copy and paste this line twice more and replace for the green and the blue channel respectively. As soon as we've done this, now all we need to do is save the code and reload the scene and we should already have an audio reactive scene. So if I go to my browser and play some music, then back to Synesthesia we can see the scene reacting by inverting all the colors according to the base. Now from here you can go back and tweak the threshold like we said before. So if the inverted scene right now seems too bright, then all we have to do is increase the threshold to 0.4 and this already will look better. But these are all details that you can experiment by yourself. This was basically it for the tutorial. You have now all the tools to explore. You can try out any of the other variables or combine them together. You can also change any of the values of the parameters and see what happens. I hope you learned something new and enjoyed watching. I'm excited to see what you come up with. If you have any questions, just leave them in the comments and I'll see you very soon with another video. Until then, have a great time. Bye!